Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everybody. Welcome to New Books and Film, a podcast channel of the New Books Network. I'm your host, Dan Moran. I am thrilled to be here today with Robert P. Kolker and Nathan Abrams. Robert is Professor Emeritus at University of Maryland, where he has taught cinema studies for almost 50 years. Nathan is a professor of film at Bangor University in Wales. Each has an impressive list of books he's written himself, but the two have previously collaborated on Eyes Wide Shut, Stanley Kubrick and the Making of His Final Film. And they are here today to talk about their new biography of the director, Kubrick, an Odyssey, published by Pegasus Books in 2024. Welcome, Robert and Nathan. Thank you. Hi. So I have to say before we start the actual interview that this book knocked the wind out of me. I was not, um, you know, uh, solicited to say this, but I just have to tell you, it was great. I thought every page of it, I mean, at the sentence level, I thought it was great. I came to such an understanding of the person. And 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 that was great because, as you know, people, you two know more than anybody else. People don't just kind of like Stanley Kubrick. They don't, they don't say, oh, yeah, I think he made some good movies. Like, like people dive into the Kubrick wormhole and they become obsessed with him. And, the, and they want to know more about the man who made these films and all we're ever told is well he was really private he was really enigmatic he was quote unquote obsessive which we'll talk about later i'm sure you're tired of hearing that word but i gotta tell you that when i read this book he really came across as a three-dimensional person i i can't imagine doing a better job in the biography sense so so i just have to say well done thank you thank you very much so let's start with the actual life. Kubrick is born in Manhattan on July 26th, 1928. So talk about his parents and his childhood. It was a very good upbringing. His father was a prosperous local physician, um, as well as an obstetrician. And he had everything he wanted, including a camera at an early age, um, which got him started. The only downside of his early years was that he hated school. Um, barely graduated high school. Yeah, I would add it was a comfortable Jewish upbringing in in the Bronx. He was kind of cosseted and protected. Um, He had a doting mother. Um, Kubrick's relationship with his mother seemed very close. Um, Not to say that it was distanced from his father. His father taught him chess and photography, two key things that um, influenced Kubrick's career, as well as pleasure time. Um, And he did have pleasure time. Um, throughout, and um, he did experience some anti-Semitism in 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 the forties uh, in in the Bronx um, when the thirties and forties, but largely I think he was sort of protected from the wider world around him. If if you think of uh, the United States in the forties and early fifties, I got a sense 30s. from his. I'm sorry. I was going to say I got a sense from his from reading your book that his parents often had conversations when he wasn't around saying, what are we going to do about Stanley? This young man's got to find some kind of direction. We know how bright he is, but it seemed like he didn't want to like fit any of the previous you know, cookie cutter molds. Yes, they certainly had those discussions about his uh, education and at one point uh, sent him off to relatives in California uh, for a year to see if the change in surroundings might uh help get him uh, kick-started in learning didn't help. He came back and he continued to cut classes and just, he even, he, he didn't even start to read until a relatively late age. Once he started, he never stopped. Um, but it took him a while to get wound up. Um, the thing he did best in his uh, young childhood um, young adolescents was walk the streets with his friends and his camera and go to the movies, always go to the movies and always complain about what he saw that he would be able to make a better film. He comes across as kind of like Peter Parker in Spider-Man, this teenager with a camera who always is trying to get the best shot. So let, let's talk about one of those. On April 12th, 1945, FDR dies and Kubrick is now 16 years old. He's got this hobby of photography. He takes a picture of a newsstand vendor with this sad expression and he's surrounded by newspapers about the president. So can can either of you talk about that moment and what that moment led to? I think he recognized Kubrick, that is recognized that something important was there. Um, Could be there because it's, the photograph is partly a setup he asked the um, newspaper vendor to look sadder than he was looking. Um, But the photograph, this perfectly 
composed, um, symmetrical um, statement about a really gripping moment in um, American history and post-war history. Um, and he knew that this was something, and he immediately took it to... Um, did he take it to look first or to the news first? He took it to one of them. I yeah. think one didn't offer as much as the other. Yeah. So uh, it ended up in Look Magazine. Right. It ended up in Look Magazine, and it started his career. Something to add is, you know, Kubrick... Um, asked the uh, vendor to look sadder than he possibly was in reality. So what we see early on in his career is this um, penchant for misdirection or, or staging. Um, staging is a key um, element of documentary craft, of documentary photography that he learned from his mentor, Rothstein, at Look Magazine. So we already see Kubrick understanding the form, manipulating it subtly, but he also knew what photograph would sell. So you can see that early marketing side um, uh, uh, early on. You know, I mean, you can't just take a good photograph, right? Um, you've you've got to be able to sell the photograph. Yeah, absolutely. Right. That's, something that came, that's something that came across in the book very often, too, was that people think he was this lone artist, and he, and, but he really was interested in making people go see the movies. Like, he wanted them well-marketed. Right. Yeah. And he was hardly lone. I mean, even in his... Um mature period of his career he was always surrounded by assistants and uh during production certainly had if not the usual number of people around he kept his, his crew as small as possible still he was working with uh, a lot of people and of course the actors so he was never alone except and he wasn't i was gonna say he wasn't just the artist um he he married he married an artistic sensibility with a commercial sense as well i mean he wanted his movies to make money right and um you know particularly in his mature years so you can see that influencing decisions through a clockwork orange onwards casting for the shiny eyes wide shut um particularly after the kind of relative failure of barry lindham so um, Kubrick wasn't just pursuing a lone artistic vision without a, a care in the world. He, he knew he had to make money for Warner Brothers, his backers from 1970 onwards or 71 onwards. And, and he wanted people to go watch his movies. You know, what, what's the point of making a film if no one's going to watch it? He had a not so secret desire to make a blockbuster. He wanted to make um, E.T. And um, never, I guess, with the exception of 2001, never got there i mean his films never struck an instant chord particularly with the with the critics they built over time and he was very aware of this which drove him to take very good care of the reproduction of his films first on videotape and then dvd because he knew that they would grow uh in interest and uh and audience as time went on. When you look back at his early photos for Look Magazine, because reading your book sent me on the internet to look at those photos, and to, I watched the documentaries on YouTube. Like your, your book, you know, it was it was a great um, joy to go back and find all those things. To what extent, when you look at those photographs he took for Look Magazine and the news, do you see Kubrick's eye present there? There are a few photographs um, that show that. Um, I for symmetrical compositions and watching for the vanishing point. There are only a few of those. There are also a few photographs of doubles, of twins or people who look closely alike, which would something that would come up often in the uh, in the films. But with few exceptions, the photographs are journalism, photojournalism. Um, if they betray anything, they betray a talent for getting the right um, composition, for posing the figure and the figures in the right way, or capturing um, characters or, or people rather um, by surprise, um, which is not something that he did in his later work. He left little to surprise. Um, so there's the sense of a visual imagination 
at work in the photographs. And I think that more than anything foretells what's, uh, what's coming. I think the other thing to say is it depends what you mean by Kubrick's eye. Uh, I think too much with Kubrick studies, it depends on which period you're considering Kubrick. Um, and we tend to then look backwards at the photography. And, and I think a consideration of photography is a relatively late development in, in Kubrick studies and scholarship. There's still not much written about it in comparison to any of the films. And, and, and the early films also suffer from that. I think the way to think about it is the other way around is, is, you know, not look back at the photographs from the films we know, but look look from the photographs to the film, uh, um, which is, you know, how how not if you mean not how the photographs foreground the films, but how the films develop out of the photographs. So, right. in addition to the things Bob said, there's the cinematic eye, but there's the staging, there's the manipulation, the misdirection, um, what looks like. Uh, 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 an unplanned surprise shot is actually staged so there's not that much difference between the photographic career and the the the, the feature film career but the, the difference is the feature films aren't passing themselves off as non-fiction whereas the photography is but so to me uh, well to us should i say that the um photography lays the groundwork for the filmmaking and really deserves greater consideration and the other thing that's interesting and we did try you know in the early chapters pretty much to list every photograph he took, hopefully not in a boring, listy way, but to show not only the range of photographs he, that, that he captured, but you can see a coalescing of interests that then guide his later career. So nudity, sexuality, um, performers, um, the unusual, social conscience, you know, cityscapes. So, you know, in a sense, you can see Kubrick's emergent interest, boxing, um, in those photographs that are more fully developed in the films. Celebrity. Yeah, absolutely. And it was not boring because I actually did use those notes in your book and go back and find the, find the films. And I encourage all the readers to do the same thing. So I want to go back to something Bob said earlier. He had a quote. I want to pull this from your book. You quote him as saying this, being a young man, he says, I don't know a goddamn thing about movies, but I know I can make a better one than that. And that was his reaction to watching movies. He comes across as somebody who from an early age had a very healthy ego. Like one of his first movie ideas, this actually made me laugh out loud, was we're going to make the Iliad. We're going to do that. We're going to make a movie of the Iliad. So can you talk about that? Like talk about his ego. Well, it, it was sound. <laughs> <laughs> and he learned early what he wanted and was pretty well aimed to get it. Um, it took him a while to get into a financial position where he could do what he knew he could do. Um, but even in that process of financing, of getting financing, he tried everything he could. Um, he approached all the people that he knew uh, found out new people to approach, depended on relatives, his rich uncles for his uh, for his first film, first feature film. Um, and he managed, he always managed uh, up to the end of his career, even when he couldn't manage to make a film that he wanted to make for various reasons. Um, he was always working and thinking and knowing what he wanted and that he could ultimately do it if everything fell into place. In some cases, things didn't fall into places. I think we have to sort of temper the, the view of um, Kubrick's sort of overarching ego. It does play into mythology of um, what we tr which we tried to puncture in the book. Yeah, Kubrick had a lot of confidence um, and, and I think you needed it. Um, you know, eldest cosseted son, beloved son of a Jewish family. And I think he needed it through the various careers he had. And there's certainly a, a, a huge dollop of chutzpah um, to, to Kubrick's career. Um, but it, not everything went his way, as Bob said. And, you know, he did have to beg and borrow to to get his early films made. He was only assured of funding somewhat from 1970 onwards. So he'd already had 20 years in the business up to that point. And not everything he wanted to do worked out. Napoleon will talk about Aryan papers, we'll talk about AI. Um, you know, and he didn't always get things right. He made mistakes. We're very keen to kind of paint a tempered picture of Kubrick where 
it wasn't this sort of egotistic will, will to power like the uh, star child at the end of 2001 he made errors yeah. and as a result of those errors he he kind of reset rethought he was always trying to push himself to do something better in in each new genre that he tackled and and, and i you could call it ego, but I think what's interesting, what we think is interesting about Kubrick is he kind of tried a different genre every time and that and wanted to reach a high bar for that. So he set himself a difficult challenge to reach with every film mm -hmm. and pushed him and his crew and his and, and those who work with him and his actors to get there. Um, and you could say, oh, well, because he, he thinks he's the greatest, he can he can make the greatest film in that genre. But I don't think it really comes across that way. I think he's always trying to struggle to be better yeah, um, rather um, than complacent. And I think the true egotist would be complacent. Yes, the true I mean, egotist would be is better than ego. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or what you said, a dollop of chutzpah. I mean, that's exactly what it was because every one of those films, you watch them and, and you, you that's what you get the sense of. Yeah, ego, he would have rested on his laurels, but he was never resting as you prove throughout the book. Um, let's talk about it. Let's talk about some of the films. Let's talk about, you, you, you make a point in the book about what he learned from each experience. And I want to ask you about what he learned about some of his early films. So the first one, Fear and Desire, 1952. Can either of you talk about what he learned from that experience? Nathan, do you want to take that? Yeah. Um, well, my favorite is um, he, he learned how to use a camera, a movie camera, which he didn't know. He got trained on that. And in the archive, there's this little note in the in, in, in one of the folders from the early years. And it said something like, we put it in a book, oil every thousand feet, ask about that. And uh, I thought of that from acorns do great trees grow. You know, this is the master filmmaker who had to ask when and how to oil a film. Yeah, he shot it on location. Um, so he learned about that. He learned about working with a skeleton um, crew, both. He learned, he learned not to be abstract. The problem with fear and desire or the matter of fear and desire is this kind of abstract idea. I mean, it starts at the very beginning with the narration saying that this takes place in a country of the mind. Um, well, all of Kubrick's films take place in a country of the mind, his mind, and ultimately our mind, but are much more rooted in, uh, in material, concrete time and space. Um, fear and desire isn't. It's awkward. It's fascinating. It's a little boring. <laughs> I, I don't if agree. Uh, will, uh, I don't know if Nathan will agree with that or not. But no, no I, 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 you know, it's only about 52, 53 minutes long. Um, I know there's a longer version now on release, which I've yet to see. Um, I think just to take Bob's point about abstraction, it's he's right. Um, the, it, Kubrick's movies, in a sense, all take place in the country of the mind but they're not so obvious in announcing it in the way that yeah. fear and desire was. And I think what fear and desire taught him was not to be so open or uh, as we say here on the nose about his intentions. It, it, it was like a game of, uh, of chess. He revealed his strategy with his opening move. And I think Kubrick learned to misdirect better. Um, probably, you know, probably by the sixties, really um i think you know when we get to the mature kubrick as we as we understand him and i think that was one of the problems with with fear and desire he also learned other things budgeting and uh he didn't quite learn the lesson of um doing sound properly because he he mucked that up on fear and desire he mucked it up again um you know having to post sync and spend far far too much money on on post production than he'd anticipated for so we do see and i think it's important to point out just as we can see technical innovations intellectual moments in his films there are errors and i think with each error he, he doesn't learn to overcome them he just makes a different error next time um <laughs> and one of the best and most intriguing paragraphs in the book was written by nathan about how fear and desire showed too much yeah um and that kubrick had to learn how to disappear more completely behind the film yeah i love that metaphor and i'm glad you brought it up nathan just now because i i highlighted that in the book where he says when you play chess you do not announce your strategy and that's exactly what he did in fear and desire so let's talk about the second film so let's go to spartacus 
Let's talk about Spartacus as one of his early films, 1960. What did he learn from Spartacus? That's a whole other book, I'm sure. But what did he learn from making Spartacus? He learned not to make a film like Spartacus. <laughs> he learned never to work in Hollywood again. He learned that the studio system ground you up and left you in pieces. He learned, and this was probably the most difficult for him to learn, that he would not, he was not in control. Um, so he made it. The film was a big success. He did learn how to make a big sprawling film which certainly helped him with 2001 mm -hmm. um it was the film that brought him the closest to contemporary politics since it involved blacklisted figures and the creation of it um but it's it's a terrific film to watch and to sort of giggle at <laughs> and know the story behind it or the stories behind it what I would say is the Kubrick that most people understand and love or hate today, you can only understand in the context of having made Spartacus. You know, some some scholars, I won't name them, have left Spartacus out of their books as if it's not a Kubrick film. But their understanding of what a Kubrick film is probably determined by the films made afterwards as, as much as it, you wouldn't have the Kubrick of Lolita, Doctor Strange, Love, 2001 and, and, and so on without Spartacus. And there were a few key things just to pull out here that we do mention in the book. Um, apart from learning to manage a big budget uh, uh, film, which was a blockbuster, he uh, with all these like support, all these major egos, he learned about improvisation, um, which Kirk Douglas um, encouraged. So Kubrick's screenplays aren't always locked down, um, despite there being a final shooting script. It's developed during the production itself. That's something we can trace back to Spartacus in particular. The other key thing is he developed his taste for British actors. Mm. Um, and, and the simple reason is British actors, most of whom are classically trained, knew their lines. So there's a great story. I, I think Kubrick told it to Frederick Raphael. He told it to one of his collaborators that um, he all the cast, all the big British principals would be muttering um, to themselves. And anytime he came near... Um, they would stop and he thought they were plotting against him until he learned they were just reciting their lines over and over again. And so that developed his taste because what Kubrick wanted and um, was that people turned up knowing inside out what he wanted them to say. And then the interesting things would develop, but nothing interesting would develop if they didn't even know their lines. And if you see once he moves to the UK and probably in part why he moved to the UK, in addition to the reasons Bob's mentioned to get as far away from Hollywood as he could, but with similar facilities and crew and expertise, know-how, but also English speaking, because he was a monoglot, um, was British actors. And and apart from a few key principles throughout his films where he, where they're demanded, if you look through from, from Lolita onwards, that everyone else is British. And uh, usually TV actors, um, often small screen actors, but who he could rely on to know their lines. And whenever he complained about an actor, by and large, probably wasn't a British one. I know I'm sounding xenophobic now, um, simply because he knew they would come up knowing their lines. And uh, sometimes he hired British actors without even knowing they were British, like Alan Cumming in Eyes Wide Shut, who um, did an American accent on the audition tape. And Kubrick was surprised to meet him in real life and 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 and, and is actually Scottish. And Kubrick said, but, but you sound an American on the tape. And, and Alan just said, Stanley? It's called acting. <laughs> and that is wonderful because that comes up several times in your book. You would think that actors would be, would be, he'd be upset with actors because they didn't reach the interiority of the character, but it keeps coming up. Like you have to know your lines. You have to start at the beginning before we can go any further. Um, let's talk, let's talk for a while about, about the, the kind of Kubrick that's become part of mythology about, you know, the, the multiple takes and, you know, Scatman Crowther's doing the same scene with Danny Lloyd over and over and things. Um, what's one of your favorite anecdotes you came across, or maybe a new one you didn't know of, of that shows the, the loving detail or the painstaking detail Kubrick took to get something right in any of his films? Well, certainly Eyes Wide Shut, the film that was gestating for 50 years. Right. Um, he was under no pressure uh, of time or budget. And if he came into a set, which he had previously approved in sketch, I suppose, and it wasn't right, 
he had it redone um, when he found or couldn't find one perfect location for the urge, uh, orgy setting. He spliced together a bunch of uh, of stately interiors of stately houses and put them together. Same thing in Barry Lyndon. Um, he waited for the perfect shot, particularly at the beginning when he started looking for the perfect shot. And after that, everything began to began to fall into place. But even after that, if his eye caught a detail that was not what he wanted, he simply had it changed. Um, it was a very slow process. And it's one of the reasons that there are so relatively few films, because he took his time. One of my favourite from Eyes Wide Shut is the underwear that the dancers at the orgy sequence are wearing. He, he obviously did his meticulous research to have them picked out. But once he looked through the camera, you know, everything had to look right on camera. It didn't matter how much planning he did. Once he looked at the monitor, he said, no, they're all wrong. And he says, like, Stanley, but you chose them. He's like, yeah, but they're still wrong. And went out and well he didn't go out but had someone go out and find new new ones it's just you know you could prepare and prepare and prepare and you know once and this is probably for the number of takes why there's so many takes you had to see what it looked like on camera first and that's once everything went well you know is the lighting right are the angles right did someone remember their lines is the mic visible in the shot you know only then once once everything's gone correctly can you then do something interesting yeah and and often he had to push the actors to places where, you know, it might come from tiredness, anger, frustration, to find something that he didn't know he was looking for until it was given to him. You make the point um, somewhere in the book, and, and you, you'll get this right for me, but one of the really illuminating statements you quote him as saying is that, you know, we all know about the multiple takes and trying to get it right, where he tells somebody else, you spent so much money on the sets and the pre-production, everything else. You might as well do as many takes as you want, because th didn't he say something like that's really, that's the least expensive thing. Just do it again. Just keep doing it until it's the way you want it. This goes back to what we were talking about earlier in terms of drive and, uh, and uh, self-possession and, and knowledge. He had to get what he knew was right. That took time. It wasn't, it wasn't for him flashes of inspiration, as far as I can understand. It was repetition that finally revealed what he ultimately understood was the gesture, the delivery, the, the placement of objects themselves that were absolutely right. So let's move on to some of his um, unproduced films, because your book does a great job of taking us through the Kubrick catalog and we could spend a, you know, a lot of time going through other films. But I want to talk about, you know, a great, great learning experience for me where, was to learn about the unmade films. So let's start talking about those. I'm going to mention them and I'd like to get your take on each one. So we'll start with Napoleon. So Kubrick said this would be the best movie ever made. Why Napoleon? What happened? What were his aims? Nathan, you want to take that? Um, yeah, he, he long well, he he long had an interest in military history, and military history leads you to a couple of places. Napoleon being one of them. Um, the other place it leads you to is German military history, and then inevitably to World War Two, and then from there to the Holocaust. So, out of an interest of military history, you can see why the, an interest in Napoleon would come. And also, he's fascinated by the figure of Napoleon, and we see him already beginning to work on the, uh, Napoleon screenplay uh, or at least an idea for screenplay whilst he's completing 2001 and um, he begins a lot of extensive pre-production on that even a screenplay script is probably too generous a term for what was produced but it was produced to try and get the funding and he had locations and costume locations sorted costumes mocked up he, he had thoughts about the technical uh, specifications of the film but it just wasn't the right time for a, another movie on Napoleon. Um, and he couldn't get the backing initially from MGM and then Warners wouldn't do it. And uh, I think they correctly calculated that Napoleon was the wrong project at the wrong time. And I think it's an interesting one because it, it shows again, Kubrick making a tactical error, that this is what he wants to do after 2001, but it's not the right film. And we see that again, replayed with Barry Lyndon. He goes ahead with Barry Lyndon in 75 and Barry Lyndon, 
doesn't do well comparatively. Even even with that lag that Bob mentioned earlier, that critical commercial or often critical lag, it does recoup its money eventually, but didn't make the return that he wished for it. So what we see is kind of Kubrick and miscalculations of, of wanting to do projects, but they're not the right projects at the right time. And arguably, I haven't seen the latest one um, <laughs> yet, but arguably that 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 miscalculated as well. So one has to wonder if Napoleon as a film <laughs> is ever the right project at the right time. Yeah. Yeah. People want to still make Napoleon. I haven't seen the Ridley Scott film yet either. I know that uh, Steven Spielberg has been wanting to uh, recreate Kubrick's ideas in a in, in an HBO series. It's all, it's important to note that in the, the preparation was extraordinary. I mean, he made an yeah. index card for almost every day in Napoleon's life. Yeah, fifteen thousand um, cards. You say he had had fifteen thousand yeah. index cards of of items that had to do with his, Napoleon's life. But you know, this miscalculation is partly maybe because he was away from Hollywood. He didn't know, perhaps, that there was a Napoleon already in the works. He did know there were a lot of earlier Napoleons, which he pushed aside. Even the Abel Gantz, uh, famous uh, 1920s Napoleon, he said, terrible. Um, but um, there were there was a Russian uh, Napoleon or War and Peace or Battle of Waterloo. I forget the title of it by a director named Bondarchuk, which is quite extraordinary with battle sequences that it's hard to imagine that Kubrick would get any better. Um, but it, he didn't know these films, and he thought this would sail right through. And as Nathan said, the market wasn't there. Yeah. You quite quite somebody the contrary, certainly. the market was there for no, no new Napoleon. Yeah, not for a new one. <laughs> you, you quote someone saying, I think it was about Barry Lyndon later, that Americans don't want to see films where people write with feathers. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's let's go on to the second one, Aryan Papers. What was the story <laughs> behind this? How did he get involved mm. with this? Why was it ultimately impossible? Well, it was a matter of script, basically. Two things, script and CGI. Uh, computer graphics. Aryan Papers, Bob. Oh, I, I was think, thinking AI. Yeah. Um, Aryan Papers, that was uh, that was really a difficult business because he got up to almost production on that. And um, let Nathan finish the story. It's a, it's a difficult story to tell. Well, like I said, Kubrick Long had an interest in German military history, which led him to World War II and which led him to the Holocaust. Obviously, being Jewish, there's probably a personal interest in there. Um, the Holocaust takes place in the precisely the places where his ancestors came from. So there's probably that idea of the, the but for the grace of God, go I. Um, so, you know, and one can trace Holocaust imagery, whether deliberate or otherwise, through, through Kubrick's work. Um, up until the early 90s, but he's always looking for the means to adapt. I think Kubrick, it's important to think about Kubrick's screenplays. They have to be adaptable. They have to be broken down in what he called uh, non into non-submersible units. And, you know, a story like the Holocaust, you think, well, how do you break that down into non-submersible units? And it takes him until 91 to find the property to adapt. And that's Lewis Begley's Wartime Lies. And, and that's doable, largely because... Um, it takes place away from the major centers of killing, whether whether in 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 the fields and forests of places like Ukraine or in the death camps like Auschwitz. It's about a young boy and his aunt masquerading as Gentile, um, using Aryan papers to to pass. It's a very you know Kubrickian sort of a, a theme in that misdirection, seeking to pass. We, we speculate on this one that um, by 93, when he abandons the project, so he's been working on it again for 91 through 93, extensive pre-production. He's got the locations nailed down, um, which aren't in Poland, primarily because Spielberg's shooting Schindler's List there and he doesn't want to compete for resources with his friend. And by 93, he changes his mind, in part because of the release of Schindler's List, and because um, he knew that um, 
an audience, a, t- a cinema going audience, couldn't bear to watch two movies about the Holocaust. And I think that's only part of the reason Warner Brothers might have prevailed on him to drop it as well for, for commercial reasons. Also, no major star in it, as they insisted upon for Eyes Wide Shut. I think other reasons might be more personal. There's the horror of the Holocaust. I mean, Christian, his widow, says that he became depressed at the time. Knowing all that meticulous research Kubrick did, he probably knew far too much than than he wanted to. Um, and there's also that sense of struggling with his own Jewishness. I mean, Kubrick was in no way religious, but he, he managed to sort of submerge Jewishness in all his films up to that point. So how do you make a film about Jewishness in which it has to be explicit? I mean, from that perspective, it's really interesting that he chose Aryan Papers, Wartime Lies, about two Jews attempting to pass as Gentile. But I think that was an added uh, problem um, to the mix. And so by 93, when it was suggested he dropped the film, I think all suggestions point to the fact that he was probably quietly relieved to do so. Although he did think he was going to, he wasn't going to give it up entirely. Um, but then it never did happen. Let's move on now to AI and Spielberg and what eventually happened. So, you know, I, one of the things I wished reading it was, I wish you could be a fly on the wall and listen to these long phone conversations between him and Spielberg, yeah. where they're going back and forth about AI and 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 Pinocchio. And it, it was just fascinating. So talk about AI and why that never came to pass uh, under Kubrick's name. He couldn't get the script that he wanted. He had a number of writers come in and try Um, I think there was an inherent sentimentality in the story that he couldn't quite control, that certainly went against the grain of much of his other work, though there is sentimentality in in Barry Lyndon. The other was finding a robot boy and finding in the 90s uh, whether CGI was up to the task. And he knew full well. I mean, one of the amusing stories, or one of the comments that he made is that if he used a real boy, by the time he was finished, he would be in his adolescence. Um, so the conversations with Spielberg continued, and he planted in... Spielberg's mind that Spielberg would direct and Kubrick would produce. Um, It was a big mistake on Spielberg's part because Stanley insisted on having a fax machine installed in uh, Spielberg's bedroom, um, which uh, Spielberg quickly learned was not going to be possible. And they sort of left it at that. I mean, he eventually turned to Eyes Wide Shut, and a few years after his death, Spielberg directed AI um, from his own script, um, but with a lot of Kubrick at base, and and including a lot of the uh, visual design that Kubrick had commissioned when he was working up pre-production on the film. So before we get to Eyes Wide Shut and the, kind of the end of his career and the end of his life, let, let's pause for a second and, and talk briefly about him as a person, because I learned a lot about his domestic life in this book. And, you know, like you said before, he got he had to get out of Hollywood. You know, what was it he liked so much about England? What was he like as a, as a husband, as a father, as a person? He was a doting father. I imagine a demanding father. Um, he loved his daughters. He loved his pets, all dozens of them. <laughs> and... Um, He most certainly loved his wife, and she not only loved him, but put up with him. Um, The relationship worked for so many years. And I don't know that we could get to any biographer, can get to who the person actually was. Um, We get a good idea of someone who, as we've said so often here, is driven in his work. Um, loving of his family, protective of his privacy, above all else. He did not want to be a celebrity, or if he did, he wanted the celebrity to be in his films and not in his person. Mm -hmm. Um, And gentle when not on set. 
I'd like to add to that. Um, it it was really difficult penetrating to you know the real domestic interior of of, of Kubrick's life in the sense that very few people have talked or written about it. There are snippets here and there. There's one book by Emilio D'Alessandro, his kind of driver and right uh, uh, sort of handyman. Um, he didn't leave notebooks and diaries in the way other filmmakers have. You know that that was that was difficult to penetrate. But what does come across from having talked to um, people close to him, including one of his daughters and and others who've worked closely with him, is a warm, kind, generous spirit. You know, we have to divorce the mo- the guy who's making the movies. Like when he's shooting the movies, he's driven. You know, seven days a week if he could, twenty five hours a day, or eight days a week, twenty five hours a day. Yeah, he he was driven in pursuit of his vision. But when he wasn't on the set, he didn't want to talk about movies. He wanted to talk about politics and art and other things. And and the the idea is warm, generous, giving. Yeah, he might have wanted something when he when he gave you a present. Um, funny. Uh, um, and and one of the things that comes across, and maybe this wasn't always understood, it comes across clearly in Frederick Raphael's um, biography. He had that goading sense of humor. I think he was always trying to push people, goad them. And he might say some things that sound outrageous, but he's looking for the reaction. And, you know, this this Jewish sense of humor, as I would call it, really comes across. Um, and and far too much of how Kubrick was on set has been spilled over into how he was in life. Right. You know, let's look at how he represents women on film um, and use that as how he is was with women um, in, in his life. I mean, it's one example I don't think you can correlate the two in 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 such a neat way. Um, there, there's there's Kubrick, the personal man, and I think he did keep them separate, even as though he used his home as his studio. He was very keen to keep those sides of him separate. It's Kubrick, the director, and then when he's not directing, mm-hmm. and I think he was able to juggle those persona. He definitely comes across he as- captured it. I'm sorry. Yeah, he definitely comes across as funny and and avuncular to certain people. I love how he's fascinated with the microwave when he gets a microwave. Like he loves his he loves his gadgetry and things he like that. He loved gadgets. He loved gadgets. <laughs> There's a great story you tell where I forget who it is, but he invites somebody to dinner and he says, "Do you like Chinese food?" And the person says, "Sure." And all of a sudden, all this Chinese food comes in, and the person <laughs> says, "I wonder what would have happened if I said no." So he, yeah. he loved to he loved to surprise people in a in a in a non threatening kind of funny way, and that's that's a big. Big thing that comes across in your book. All right, so let's move on to his last film. Let's move on to Eyes Wide Shut. So the reader learns that he was making this movie off and on in his head for for years and years. I remember, you remember when it was first leaked, when it was coming out. The buildup to this for people that weren't alive then was just incredible. I mean, the anticipation for this film to come out was just incredible. And something that comes up over and over in the book is that the degree to which he would search for the right story where he had even like people reading things for him and reporting back <clears throat> synopses that he could possibly use and not knowing that they were st- sending these things to Stanley Kubrick, right? So he was he was big on like, you got to get the right story, right? So what was it about the story behind Eyes Wide Shut that, that made him say, right, this is what I want to do? Right, right, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Well, his, his um, we, we, we suggest that Kubrick was introduced to Eyes Wide Shut probably in the 50s. Um, there's multiple sources for that. That could be his, um, maybe maybe at the courses he audited at CCNY or Columbia. Uh, sorry, he took classes at CCNY at City College, New York, and audited classes at Columbia. And then he, the, the the woman who became his second wife, Ruth Sabotka, who was, who was Viennese, maybe she lent it to him. Kirk Douglas claims it was his psychiatrist who gave it to him in, in 59 when they were having trouble on the set of Spartacus. But we we think that he definitely read it by the 50s, and Trauma novella in particular. I mean, there's the Freudian element. Schnitzler is a contemporary of Freud. Um, Freud described him as his doppelganger, and that what Freud was doing scientifically, um, Schnitzler was doing imaginatively and doing it better. It was Freud's conclusion. Kubrick was a massive Freudian in 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 and that might see his influence in his work. Mm-hmm. And there was something about that element of jealousy in 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 the, and and marriage. Marriage. Right. Yeah, in that 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 appealed to him. Um I suppose what we suspect is that Kubrick meticulously researched everything. Um 
you can't really meticulously research marriage, can you? I think the only way you ret- meticulously research marriage is by being married for a long time. <laughs> Otherwise, you haven't done it properly. <laughs> Arguably, um, that's that's my suggestion. And you know, Christian kept telling him not to do it. Right. You know, we're too young. We're too young. Not yet. Not yet. And maybe by the nineties. Like, Fine, Stanley. Stop. Stop pestering. <laughs> stop being a nudnik. <laughs> Go make the film. And I think this was. This came out in discussions for our previous book. Um, and I think Bob came up with the formulation. Was he spent his career putting big things on the big screen: space, nuclear war, Vietnam War, the Seven Years' War. Um, how do you put intimate and mundane moments on the big screen in a big way, <laughs> but maintain their intimacy and mundanity at the same time? And I think that that takes work. Um, so I think there were lots of reasons why he struggled with it as well, much as why he was drawn to it. Um, and also, you know, Schnitzler's from the capital of the empire from which his ancestors hailed. He's a very Jewish author. He's dealing with themes that, that Kubrick has dealt with throughout his career. Um, we also have to mention sex. One of the things that appealed to him about Napoleon was, as he said, Napoleon, um, I think it's this way around, had a sex life worthy of Arthur Schnitzler. Or was it Arthur Schnitzler had a sex life worthy of Napoleon? <laughs> but he certainly drew the comparison. Um, and and so we, you know, one of the things that's interesting to do as a thought exercise is think, right, this is what... Nixon froze for a bit. Um, marriage, I think, is the um, is a key here. Um, and, and intimacy. And I think there are a couple of things that led to the disappointment at first view of the film. And one of which, as Nathan pointed out, is that it is a smaller scale than the previous films. There are not those big set pieces. Even the orgy has a strange, distant, dreamlike aura about it. And the fact that it um, that it deals with the most intimate thing in a person's life or in a couple's life, certainly. And it was difficult for him, and I think it was difficult for audiences, and it was difficult for these two big stars to suddenly be seen in this small, contained, and intimate way. Um, the fact that it was a dream film, in many ways, it was Kubrick's dream of a film that he want, that he dreamt about for so long. But it's also a film that is about a dream and is about dreaming and maybe is a dream. And that is communicated through the artifice, the artificiality of the film, the studio sets of New York streets, um, all of which given time um, really are affecting and full of emotion and um, uncertainty and even that most Kubrickian of of moods, dread. Um, And this was hard for audiences um, who were used to something completely different. But I think as always, in retrospect, it has grown as a kind of uh, important capstone to the career. Certainly. So Kubrick dies in March of 1999. I think he dies six days after he shows the, the cut to Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. So I want to end last question with a little thought experiment. And this is purely speculative. We said earlier, you know, what did he learn from Fear and Desire? What did he learn from Spartacus? If Kubrick were around longer to see the reaction, the reception of Eyes Wide Shut, what do you think he would have learned from that? Or what do you think his reaction might have been? We know this is totally speculative, but I have to ask. Hmm. That's a great question. Um, it's hard to answer. I think he would have been used to it. By now. <laughs> right. Um, I think he would have been satisfied. Um, and he would throw the onus back on the critics and maybe the audience. He may have, in retrospect, um, not approved the kind of publicity the film was given. 
because it was publicity that was misdirected. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the, the publicity was not what the film was about. Exactly. And um, I think he may have been aware of that. How about you, Nathan? What would you say if you had a, if you had a fantasize about Cooper's reaction? Yeah, I definitely think he would have um, acknowledged the mistakes that were made in marketing um, and some of which would have been rectified. And and it was a problem because he usually took control of it. So when he passed, someone else had to. So decisions were made that probably he would have disagreed with. Um, I don't know how much of the film he would have tinkered with. There was an argument that, that it would have been very different had he been alive and that what we saw wasn't the vision he wanted to put on the screen. I, we don't agree with that. Um, I did have another thought. and it... That's okay. I do remember, I certainly, and I'd love to get your final take on this, is that I, I, I very much remember the marketing campaign, and I very much remember going to see Eyes Wide Shut the day it opened, and then thinking when I walked out, like, that's not the movie. <laughs> That, you know, you know, in a, in a wonderful way, right? That's it's always good to be surprised that way. But it's it's certainly not the movie as it was billed before the, in the, this great lead up. I, I, the thing is, yeah, how do you sell that kind of movie? So right. maybe there was a cynical edge, um, uh, a cynical edge to it. I know what I wanted to say. Um, so much of what was said about Eyes Wide Shut was said in his absence, and that included Frederick Raphael's memoir, which it's been suggested wouldn't have been published as is. Not because Kubrick would have changed it, because Raphael would have done it, had Kubrick been alive. So it's a big counterfactual. But would the reception have been the same, different, worse with him alive? I, I think there is that element that we've waited 12 years for a Kubrick movie. And I think if you wait 12 years for anything, it's never going to turn out to be quite as good as you've pictured it in your head over those 12 years. That's no disrespect to the film. I've just watched it again recently in 4K. And think, yeah, it's still it's still great. Although some of it you watch now with a post Me Too mentality and cringe at, um, you know, DeSander Zavos, for example, and just think, oh, he wouldn't be in a film now. Um, but you know, it is it is a reflective of its times. But so I think there's going to be that inevitable disappointment. And also, you've probably got some critics who are, aren't that well versed in Kubrick's films. You know, they maybe just graduated and um don't know what to expect and and want to make a name for themselves and what better way to make a name for yourself than taking a shot at the king um that doesn't necessarily reflect on how kubrick would have done things differently the interesting thing is what would he have done next as a film and Ant anthony fruin says it was going to be eric bright eyes but there's some dis debate over that i always like to uh, refer when thinking about eyes wide shut to the literary critic edward saeed who uh, wrote about late style and talked about the artist, the mature aging artist who was no longer bound by being extraordinary, who lived his work and did the work that he wanted to do without any constraints. And I think that very much explains uh, Eyes Wide Shut. Robert and Nathan, it has been great talking with you today. Kubrick and Odyssey is published by Pegasus Books. It's available wherever books are sold. If you know anybody, including yourself, who is an admirer of the work of Stanley Kubrick, it's an absolute must read. I know I'm giving it the hard sell, but I heartily, heartily endorse it. Great job with the book. And thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you.